Hello, everyone, and welcome to another session of our 45 Minutes on Webinar series by ESI. Uh, today, we're talking about how to build a low carbon circular economy by looking at how materials move into the aluminum cycles. Uh, well, this is important as we see more and more demand for aluminum, especially with the rise of green technologies such as electric vehicles and uh, uh, batteries. So we are happy to have Dr. Roman Billy uh, with us to share his insights. Uh, Dr. Billy is a researcher at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology, NTNU, in Trondheim, Norway. Uh, in his research, he is developing material flow analysis and stock dynamics models to monitor and stimulate global metal cycles and their emissions over time with a focus on aluminum and battery materials. These models explore in particular the role of materials as enablers of the green transition in the transport and energy sectors. The aim is to design future scenarios for the impact of these transi uh, transitions on primary demand, resource availability, scrap generation, and recycling technology. Dr. Billy has a PhD and a master's in science in industrial ecology from NTNU and a master's in science in engineering from the Ecole Centrale uh, de Nantes. So um, we will discuss how uh, the MFA methods and stock dynamics uh, methods uh, can help create better plans for a circular economy within the aluminum industry. Uh, and we hope uh, you have questions and join in, uh, the discussions to get uh, the most of today's sessions. So here are the rules uh, for the Q&A. So open the Q&A window. Uh, you can see the, the logo there and type your questions uh, into the Q&A box and click send. And we will try to answer uh, as many questions as we can during the during the session. So uh, if you have also technical issues, uh, raise, uh, use the, the chat uh, space too, um, or uh, raise your hand and we can uh, give you some support uh, in the background. Um, so, uh, we will now uh, welcome Dr. Roman Billy as he guides guide us through the understanding of material flows and how they affect the carbon footprint and recycling in the aluminum industry. So over to you, Roman. Uh, thanks, Gabriel, and uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining. Uh, yes, so I will start with uh, this figure that I think many of you are familiar with. It's from this uh, AluCycle uh, website, uh, by the International Aluminium Institute that is mapping the uh, the flows and, and stocks of aluminium uh, across the world. Uh, and uh, if I'm showing this, it's because this figure is made with the metal that we, we develop, especially at, uh, at uh, NTNU, uh, which is material for analysis. And this is the, you know, the, the basic methodology behind these nice visualizations. Uh, and, uh, but what you see in the in, in this AluCycle website that is very really nice, but we are a bit uh, you just have the flows of aluminium and not so much maybe the uh, the link with the uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, at the moment. So one of the things I'm trying to do is to try to make this link a bit more explicit between uh, the patterns that we see in the in the flows of uh, uh, aluminium use and how this results in uh, 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 emissions and how we can try to reduce them with increased circularity, for instance, or or new technologies, or, or and just uh, optimizing the existing systems. Um, so to give a bit more uh, background on, on this type of method, uh, so we say that there are four dimensions of this material flow analysis models. So the first one is the the stages. So you saw that in the previous figure is just like. Uh, the different processes of the along the supply chain. So, for instance, from the uh, the mining to refining to to smelting and uh, uh, I don't know like extrusion, manufacturing, and so on, and until the um, use and the, the waste management. Uh, we also have the second dimension that is trade, uh, which was also uh, pretty uh, uh, straightforward in the previous diagram, where you see the trade between the different uh, regions, and that's how we exchange the, uh, these flows in these international supply chains and, and these networks. Uh, we also have layers. So uh, layers is usually could be like a, the total mass of materials. It could be just a, the, the mass in one uh, chemical element. So in the previous diagram, it was just the flows of aluminum. Uh, but for instance, in bauxite, the aluminum content is 
less than uh, in uh, in pure aluminium. So the previous diagram was only showing the, the mass flows of, of aluminium, not of total goods, but you could also show a layer of uh, energy. You could show a layer of, uh, of the, the value of the material. So uh, of different chemical elements, like for instance, you could consider oxygen or carbon, for instance, which is something we didn't have in the uh, IEI visualization. And the uh, fourth dimension is time and to see how uh, these stocks and flows evolved, how we build stock over time and uh, how we can use that to understand the historical development and make future scenarios uh, uh, about the, the evolution of the cycles and, and their emissions. Um, we also have in fact like seven components uh, that are needed to monitor the physical economy and the interesting thing is like they form a hierarchical structure so therefore this pyramid that we have here and at the bottom of the pyramid we have the the systems which is that it's if you don't understand how a system is working how are the different stages in your system uh how the the, what is the structure of the aluminum industry for instance you can have very good data you probably will interpret it wrong so the basis is the system and then on top of it you need good data uh, and when you have that you can start making models and scenarios you can start calculating uncertainty and from this you can make nice visualizations than the one i showed before uh, you can develop uh, performance indicators and all of this could be used for strategy and decision support uh, but the important thing is that this is only as good as the bottom of this pyramid so if you uh so we need actually this may be uh, a bit difficult and uh, uh and not so fun work of really getting at the at the very detailed level of things to understand how the systems work and to to get good data uh to be able to have the the nice interesting models and make good uh, strategic recommendations for instance so with this in mind i will start actually with the uh, bottom-up uh, modeling uh, with an example of uh, a study we we made on uh, together with uh, with uh, hydro uh, on an aluminium smelter uh, and how we try to use mfa to develop a new approach to for physical accounting so compared to maybe like more classical accounting we don't really look at the values of the flows but we try to record all the mass of the different flows in a systematic way and see how we can use that for uh, um, accounting uh, emissions and try to suggest uh, strategies to optimize uh, the, the emission reduction and the, the, the functioning of, of the plant in general. So this is, uh, I have the link here. This paper is also, if you want to see the detail, it's open access. Uh, yes, and so the motivation we had for doing that uh, together with Hydro was that uh, the carbon reporting was actually getting uh, complex. Uh, so in Europe, uh, we have this uh, EU uh, ETS uh, for uh, reporting and trading uh, emission permits that determines in the end carbon prices and, and so on. Uh, the problem for aluminum producers is that uh, this is actually represent some, some work to compute these reportings. And uh, they also thought that is something you know that you have to do because it's the regulation, but it was not really helpful in terms of uh, optimizing their their own performance. Uh, they were so they still needed to maintain their old performance indicators that were uh, more detailed than what you need to do uh, for the reporting. And there are these like two effects, uh, uh, sorry, two systems existing at the same time, uh, making it you know like very inefficient, and uh, you don't have a good overview, and you spend a lot of time and money and just maintaining uh, this this reporting. And this is like, so this study was like, we did that a couple of years ago. Now it's getting uh, also even more important because uh, uh, the aluminum industry is uh, no longer uh, uh, exempted from this uh, uh, trading system. And there is like the carbon border adjustment mechanism that will come into place in uh, the next years, uh, making this even more uh, an important topic. And then, so we try to see, okay, can we use this uh, material for analysis to try to reconcile these two systems? So having uh, some sort of reporting that centralizes everything, mapping all the flows uh, at the plant level, and try to see if we can have then use it for emission reporting and using for uh, performance indicators, everything at, at once uh, with you know something that is consistent and, and robust. And you can see the consequence of changing one thing on both your performance indicators and your emissions. So that was the basic idea to use this method that is mostly used 
you know, historically more at the global level, maybe to use it at the almost smaller scale of like one plant. Um, so the plant in question was the the smelter in Sundal, but which is in a way which is interesting because it has also like on site anode production and baking. We have uh, two lines for electrolysis, uh, but there is also a cast house and uh, there is the storage of uh, raw materials on, on site. So it's actually quite a lot of things to monitor. There are a lot of flows of materials between these different uh, parts of the, the plant as well. Uh, and because you have all these different parts of the plants, then there are systemic effects that maybe you could you know, optimize something that uh, the electrolysis would be uh, more efficient, but then you have a problem with the anode production or the cast house. Or, uh, so the idea is to, instead of just optim optimizing one process, we try to optimize the, the overall system and to have overall reduction uh, of emissions or increase in efficiency. Uh, and this kind of overview is not something that they had at the time that good overview of specific processes, but not necessarily the entirety of the plant. So if we make a uh, uh, sort of very simplified MFA uh, system representation of the plant, so we have this different element that I showed. Uh, and for instance, the, all the flows regarding the anode is like uh, making, baking the anodes, uh, using them in electrolysis, and then there is uh, the uh, replace, recycles, and uh, it goes back in the loop. We also have something a bit similar with the, the cathodes, for instance. So all of these are mostly carbon flows. We also have the flows that are mostly aluminum. So uh, most of it comes as uh, alumina and uh, ends up as uh, uh, in the end extrusion billets of or casting ingots, but you have some losses uh, along the way. Uh, and there is the, the fuel that is used uh, to not in the product, but just to, to power the process. So heating for the anode uh, production and the cast house. And uh, of course we have emissions uh, at all these stages. And we have more uh, complicated flows with, you know, like fluoride that is coming. And then uh, you have uh, uh, fluoride in all of your waste and it's creating some, some issues maybe. So to map that in a systematic way, uh, we, you know, have actually a much more detailed system that I cannot show here because it's too big, but with 12 processes and 14 inventories of materials. So it's about 80 flows within the plant. And we try to quantify all those flows with mostly with data uh, from internally in the company. Uh, when something was missing, we try to have interviews with plant personnel, see if we can if we can get a better understanding of specific parts of the plant, specific flows, and then was complemented with uh, extra uh, lab analysis or, or just finding data, uh, average data in the literature uh, about this. Uh, and uh, we calculated. Uh, uh, the flows with uh, most of the flows are we use the principle of mass conservation that everything that comes into a process uh, needs to be equal to what comes out or, or if there is a stock change in the process uh, and we also use the slope methodology that is uh, what is used for calculate the pfc emissions uh, in the smelters for instance uh, i'm not going to go so much into detail into that but this is the end products where we have for instance a, a map of all carbon flows and emission within the plant. So we see in the system of the plant uh, where are the big flows of carbon uh, in which process and where are the, the emissions. Uh, and so most of the emissions, uh, so here just direct emissions. So of course we don't have anything related to electricity, but still most of the direct emissions come from the uh, smelting and the, the consumption of the anodes, but we also have some emissions in the uh, anode production and roading uh, phase and in the cast house. And so what is interesting with this approach is compared to the UETS or the normal carbon reporting is that we really have um, at a detail level, we know where in the plant the emissions are occurring and uh, from which uh, source. So is it from fuel combustion? Is it from the uh, from the anode? Is it for uh, anode defects or air burn? Is uh, this kind of things. Uh, while if you have just the UETS uh, carbon reporting, you only know what happens uh, in the globality of your plant and you don't know exactly where they are located. So, of course, it's a bit more difficult to, to find ways to reduce it uh, because you just have, you don't have enough understanding. Uh, this also allowed us to make uh, system-based indicators that are consistent with this emission reporting. Uh, so, here I cannot show a lot and also we 
have some limitations with regards to confidentiality. But for instance, in this smelter, there are two smelting lines and they perform um, uh, differently in, in, in some aspects. And you know, one line is more efficient at converting alumina, uh, but the other one is, for instance, is less efficient in terms of uh, CO2 emissions. So you see that you have some, some trade-off there and maybe there are things that you can optimize. And and you could calculate also like if you optimize this and that in your system, maybe this results in so much reduction in your carbon reporting as well. Uh, so you can integrate these two aspects and have these KPIs that are linked to your emission reporting, which is very useful for the strategic planning. Um, another thing we did was this sort of cartography of the all the waste flows that happen in the plants. And that was really interesting because when we went to visit the plant, they were just like, I mean, the amount of of the scale of the, the aluminum production in every year uh, ends up that even if you have very small flows in, in percentage, you end up with considerable amounts of waste everywhere around the plant. And no one really knows what this is. I mean, uh, for some of them, it's, it's well known, but there's a lot of uh, ways that we don't really know what this is, what is the exact composition. And there are probably things that can be improved in how to create value from these waste flows. So if you do that, if, you, if something that was landfill becomes recycled, you probably can suddenly make money uh, with something that you used to be paying for before, uh, but uh, also you increase the circularity and reduce your emissions. And again, this would be connected to uh, the emission reporting so you can see what you would save using these methods. And so what was really interesting with doing this systematic mapping was that we we map so we have the size of the the waste flows uh we also have their composition in aluminium and carbon contents and whether they are recycled or or, or incinerated for energy recovery or just landfill and the interesting thing is like everything that is almost uh full uh, uh aluminium can be easily recycled or if it's just aluminium but no carbon it's usually recycled if it's almost pure uh, carbon it can be recycled or otherwise uh, it can be used for energy recovery. If you have a bit of a mix of everything, then it gets very hard to do something with it, and then it ends up landfill. So with this kind of overview of all the waste flows that your plant generates, then you can see if like, okay, maybe there are things we can change in the way we, we deal with this waste or the way we, we, we tune this process that we can maybe increase the circularity within our plant uh, and in the end identify how much uh, uh, carbon emissions we would save. Uh, and then we could also use, so this is very theoretical, but see what could, is the potential to reduce emissions at different parts in the plant. So for instance, you could increase the efficiency of the how alumina is, is reduced. You know, if we are to use all the alumina, then you have some potential for improvement there. You can limit air burn or anode effects, but a lot has been done on that already. Uh, or you can, for instance, uh, change the energy carriers uh, uh, replace LNG with electricity or hydrogen. And that's actually something that we are looking at now in a, in a follow-up project. Uh, we are working on a European project where we look at plant level material for analysis to see what is the potential to, to use hydrogen uh, in the aluminum and steel industries. Um, so the idea is that you can use this same framework to make new strategies for reducing emissions. Uh, so to conclude, uh, some of the benefits of this approach is like, this is more robust than UETS because you have this mass balance consistency, you know that everything gets in, must get out in some way. And it makes that your results are, there is a sort of double check uh, uh, that comes uh, by default in a way. And we have a much higher granularity than uh, the UETS, which uh, enables to make this uh, uh, more robust KPIs as well. And uh, that you can use the same source of data to feed the two different things, the official reporting and the internal uh, reporting, and uh, with the idea that you can uh, save uh, time and cost with that. Uh, and find the systemic solutions and see there are maybe things that by tuning a process slightly differently, then uh, you optimize the, the your production at the level of the whole plant. Uh, yeah, and finally, yeah, hopefully that this could uh, save cost, and this is going into uh, moving a bit behind that carbon accounting. That okay, monitoring the carbon emissions is a good thing, but it's even better if you could find 
uh, if you could act actively propose like, okay, but if we were uh, doing something about this specifically, then we would reduce the impact by that much. And this goes into, you know, having good systems and good data that can in the end be used to inform uh, the strategies and, and the decisions that uh, industries make. So, yes, this is the the end of this first part. And um, now I'm going to uh, present another study that we did that there is it's much more uh, top down and uh, much more about uh, uh, seeing how uh, long term changes um, affect the uh, uh, recycling of aluminium and uh, carbon emissions, specifically with uh, automotive uh, aluminium. So again, this is a paper that is published in open access. So uh, you can uh, check it if you want uh, more details. Um, but the basic idea with the study was that uh, currently there are several trends in the automotive industry that all lead to using more aluminum in cars. Uh, so historically, aluminum has been used mostly for light weighting. Uh, this is still the case. We do more and more light weighting. We use aluminum in new components uh, every year. Uh, and this trend with the transition to electric vehicles is even uh, increased because EVs have, uh, they actually use more aluminum in the batteries and the casings and than what you would have in uh, uh, international, uh, sorry, internal combustion engine car. Uh, so the shift to electric vehicles just by itself increases the aluminum use, but also since EVs tend to be heavier, uh, then uh, it's even more important to do light weighting also because you want to increase the, the range of the car and you want to limit the size of the batteries and so on. So you have very good incentive to use even more aluminum in electric cars. Uh, and especially if it's an electric SUV, for instance. So this is another trend that in the last 10 years or so, uh, cars are getting much bigger. And so if you combine all those things, you are a very good case for using more and more aluminum, making big electric cars still relatively lightweight. Um, and at the same time, especially globally, you still have an increasing population and, and car ownership. So maybe not so much the case in, in, in Europe or, or North America, but uh, in other parts of the world, there is a, a, a increasing demand of population for transportation and it will need to be met one way or, or another. But then we can say, okay, there will be more aluminum, but why does it even matter? Because there are a lot of studies that say it's actually good to use aluminum uh, in cars because you will have more emissions in the, uh, you know, for the from the materials and from the construction side. But after that, you will save more in the use phase with the uh, fuel, uh, better fuel efficiency of your car. And then it makes sense to use more aluminum. So it shouldn't be a problem. And especially today, I know, you know most of the audience is from uh, some sort or some part of the aluminum industry. And I'm not saying that uh, we should not use aluminum. I still think that it is good. The issue that we might have is that uh, once we reduce most of the emissions from fuel consumption, which is the case with uh, electric cars, especially if we can charge our cars with uh, renewable electricity in the future, then the next step is to try to decrease the emission from the construction of the cars. And then if you look at that, uh, then aluminum is uh, very likely to be the, to have the lion's share of these emissions in the future, uh, more than all the battery uh, materials that everyone talks about all the time, like uh, how energy intensive are the, is the battery production and so on. It's true, but in the future, it's aluminum is going to be more than that. And uh, this is actually a problem that a lot of uh, life cycle assessments and, and batteries and, and EVs, they tend to underestimate the importance of aluminum in this carbon footprint. Uh, this is the only study I could find that actually shows uh, this. Uh, but otherwise, you can always, a lot of these studies, they will make assumption, for instance, that uh, if the aluminum, uh, if a, a, let's say a Tesla is produced in the US um, with aluminum from Canada, then it has a quite low carbon footprint, and that's fair enough for this single car. Uh, but if you were to generalize it to the, the rest of the world and assume that uh, globally everyone will have electric cars, then some of the, this aluminum will be produced in China with a much higher carbon footprint, and then you can't really scale up this kind of results. Uh, also, the assumptions you make about recycling might tend to, to reduce the importance of aluminum in a carbon footprint. But when you look at future scenarios, you see that it can really get 
uh, actually a lot. Uh, so to address this, uh, we made this uh, dynamic MFA model, uh, and uh, I'm not going into details, but uh, uh, so we have the different process in the supply chain, but we also have uh, quite a detailed understanding of how much aluminum is in different types of cars in terms of uh, uh, which region, which uh, type of, uh, is it electric or hybrid or, or not, or is it a big or a small car and uh, and so on. And we have three uh, alloy groups for road primary castings and secondary castings, which is not very precise, but gives a first understanding of the changes we might have with recycling. Um, so with all these parameters, uh, it we for each parameter, we have different scenarios. And we when we combine all of them, uh, we end up with uh, more than 8,000 scenarios. Uh, that allows us to really have a, a vision of a lot of potential futures and what can happen. Uh, so it's not it's not a prediction, but we really look at what happened in this case, and uh, we can really explore all the space of possibilities. Uh, so, for instance, if if we take something that is very uh, you know quite baseline and average for most of the parameters, so the system this is the system in in twenty twenty, in twenty fifty it could look like that. So all the flows are getting much bigger. And what we see that is also concerning is that there is a risk of uh, scrap surplus of uh, mixed scrap that uh, we don't really have a use for anymore because we don't have internal combustion engines anymore. And uh, these secondary castings, we we might have a problem to to find applications for it uh, unless we really improve the way we 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 sort we dismantle and uh, we sort the different waste flows to try to do make it alloy to alloy recycling or at least keep some uh, uh, aluminium in the road family. Um, when we look at all these more than eight thousand scenarios, uh, we get a better picture of what is this the scale of the demand increase. Uh, so in this figure, the the colors are about the the penetration of uh, electric cars. So the dark blue is like assuming that it stays uh, as low as today, so almost nothing, which is probably not so realistic. And the other three are scenarios from the International Energy Agency, uh, from the step, which is the, the stated policies uh, based on what the, the countries are saying that they will do, what are their targets. Then there is the SUS, is the sustainable development that is a bit more ambitious. And NZE is the net zero scenario, what the IEA uh, says we should do in order to have uh, a net zero uh, trajectory in 2050, which means a lot more electric cars and which means much more aluminum. Uh, but in average, uh, our model uh, for cars, depending on the scenarios, that's uh, aluminum using car is likely to increase by a factor of three to five in 2050 compared to now, uh, if the trends continue as uh, as they are now. Uh, and especially uh, if we have uh, more and faster electrification, then there would be more aluminum. So it starts really being a, more, uh, a lot of, of aluminum compared to, you know, 80 megaton per year is more or less what we produce today. And more than that in 2050 might be used for cars alone. So this is really potential to, to really uh, bring a huge change in the cycle. Um, when we look at recycling, potential recycling issues and what will be in the future the demand for uh, each alloy group and also which scrap we generate. Uh, what we see is that the demand for wrought aluminum will increase a lot, but not so much uh, for castings and especially secondary castings. That's the one that is likely to not increase so much. Uh, and we see that, especially in high electrification scenarios, that's where you have the highest demand for cast uh, for sorry, the highest demand for wrought aluminum. Uh, but the lowest DN for secondary castings. So you can get into this mismatch uh, that uh, electrification is changing the, the needs that we have. Uh, and which might result, as I said before, at this problem of scrap surplus, which is that if we end up with uh, mixed scrap uh, as it is today, and the only thing we can do with it is to make secondary castings. And if there is no demand for it, then maybe we have a scrap surplus. Um, and the scrap surplus is um, uh, get the, the risk of having a scrap surplus is increased a lot by uh, electrification. So in these net zero scenarios, then uh, a very big scrap surplus might come 
quite fast. And that is a problem that we can try to mitigate by either increasing the, the lifetime of the car. So if we keep car for uh, a bit longer in use, uh, then we both delay a bit when this crop surplus will come. And also it will be a bit uh, smaller. But what we can really do to reduce this risk is to have alloy sorting technologies or, or uh, such as uh, uh, that that would be able to separate at least between the big alloy families or increase dismantling, but at least do something with the way we treat the waste. Uh, there are also other promising technologies that claim that it will be possible to upcycle this automotive aluminum scrap in the future into very pure aluminum with uh, still a lower energy consumption that at least primary. Uh, the question is how realistic is it and when can we expect it to happen? And here I, I don't really know. Uh, and uh, so it's not very clear if it can really play a big role. And I think it, it should probably be, uh, you know, like last chance solution, uh, but still is going to use more energy than classic remelting. So if we could do better sorting and dismantling, there is probably a better potential to reduce uh, emissions and energies than uh, with those technologies, at least in the short term. And when it comes to uh, carbon emissions, so we we looked at okay what would be the emissions for this increasing aluminium demand and uh, we assumed both some sort of business as usual scenario where the carbon footprint of aluminium production the global average will remain more or less constant which is the trend we saw in the last 20 years or so uh, but there are also uh, of course uh, much more optimistic scenarios so this one is from the international aluminium institute uh, where they have they made this like uh, two degrees or 1.5 degree scenarios and how the aluminum industry is going to reach uh, those targets. And we use those for computing the future of uh, carbon emissions. Uh, so when uh, we put that in a figure, so the here the, the line on top is the uh, annual carbon footprint that is generated from aluminum used in car. On the left is the business as usual scenario. On the right is the below two degree scenario and the medium is something uh, uh, in between. Um, what we see, we see from there is that uh, mitigation efforts in the aluminum industry can effectively bring back uh, the carbon emissions to current level in 2050. So this is quite good. Like we actually achieved the targets in 2050. But in the meantime, uh, not really, because what happens is that uh, EV penetration needs to be so fast in these net zero scenarios that uh, it happens faster than how fast the aluminum industry can change. And then we end up a lot of emissions in the 2030, 2040 uh, years, uh, which means that when we look at the cumulative emissions, that is the bottom line uh, in this figure, uh, it's very challenging to mitigate. And they are the ones that actually matter for uh, for uh, global uh, warming and uh, fighting climate change. Uh, so we need to have this change in the aluminum industry as fast as possible so that it can uh, change together with the automotive industry and not being late. And if not, so this is like, I put some reference line, this is a line of 5% of global annual uh, emissions. And this is 5% of the remaining carbon budget for uh, 1.5 uh, world. Uh, so here it's just aluminum and just in cars. So it's pretty clear that, of course, we need aluminum for the energy transition, and it has a very important role to play for that. But at the same time, it's not possible to use 5% of our carbon budget just for that. So it's very important to, if we want aluminum to play a big role, it has to be cleaner aluminum than what it is today. Uh, yes, so as a conclusion, uh, so some takeaway messages from this study is that the aluminum uh, demand is likely to increase by factor three to five towards 2050. And that if we don't do anything about it, then the carbon footprint of aluminum would be the, uh, the, the biggest contributor to the carbon footprint of cars in the future. And this is not enough to just decarbonize primary aluminum production. We also need to uh, do better recycling, uh, um, solve this issue of potential scrap surplus, and look at what can be done along the world supply chain between aluminum producers, car manufacturers, and scrap dealers to find systemic solutions that will solve this together and not just by 
one company trying to implement uh, a better recycling process so these kind of things so yes that's the end of my presentation uh, i also put the link here we have uh, an interesting uh, interactive dashboard that you can use to play with all the this like more than 8000 scenarios i've shown so you can uh, uh, click and see what happens if we change this and that uh, so there is a link for that and uh, yes that's it thank you thank you very much uh, Roman. Uh, very insightful and you highlight very precisely the challenge that we have uh, in terms of um, aluminum consumption and the link with circularity and climate change uh, we have a minute for some uh, questions um, and we got one here, uh, which is, can we use the plant level MFA approach for monitor monitoring other flows than carbon and aluminum? And what are the potential applications? Yes, uh, so that's something that I didn't show here and is not in the, the available publication that we have. But after this work with uh, Hydro, we had some uh, follow-up projects uh, especially with, with students that were working on that. And one thing we were looking at was, for instance, in, in the same plant, uh, adding more layers into the system. So looking into more elements that not just aluminum and carbon. And we had, for instance, uh, uh, looking at uh, sodium and uh, fluoride uh, flows. Uh, and then that allowed us to go into more into detail what I was showing with how much waste the plant is generating and what is the composition of this waste. Well. One thing that they were not too happy with is that they were generating too much excess bath in the electrolysis process, mostly because of the balance between uh, sodium and fluoride in the electrolysis. And so, for instance, by adding those elements into the, the material for analysis, then we can get a much better overview of um, where these flows are being consumed, uh, in which circumstances, and help get a better understanding of what is going on. because. It's also not so easy to understand what is happening in 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 one electrolysis spot, uh, especially if you have like uh, 300 of them, and you it's very hard to monitor at the same time. So with this kind of models, we could get some some better understanding of like, uh, uh, okay, in these situations that you end up using more raw materials than what you should, and that's maybe a thing that you can try to uh, uh, to to work on on this and solve it. So yeah, that's that's one example, but. Uh, uh, with the same plants, but otherwise we've been also applying this approach with uh, other partners. Uh, we've been using it for uh, battery recycling facility, for instance, uh, and especially as it is quite new, uh, it's a new process. And then we could guide them into how to tune uh, the fine tuning of the different sorting processes and uh, in order to, to get the, the, the best composition in the different recycling fractions. Uh, that they were getting, for instance. So uh, we st we started with this aluminum smelter on aluminum and carbon flows, but uh, this is really an, an approach that can be applied to pretty much uh, anything. And usually what we do is just, we, we just start doing it, not really knowing what we will find, but we end up finding interesting things. And then when you say, oh, this is this thing is interesting here, maybe we can work a bit more on this. And then it generates usually interesting uh, results that uh no one really thought about before we started so that's also the idea of that is it brings a completely novel view of how plants are functioning and uh, usually people working in the plant they don't have this kind of overviews they are more specialists into one process or the other one and and, and no one really has the time or the understanding to to look at these things uh, in a more systemic systemic way so okay yeah. thank you uh Couple of questions from the top-down uh, model. The first one, um, we have seen the adoption of carbon reinforced uh, fabric plastic in the automotive industry. What is the adoption scenario? For replacing aluminum by plastic? I guess so, yeah. 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 Um, well, so it's true that this, so uh, this model is not really looking at uh, the other materials that can be in the cars. Uh, so how much plastic will be used in the future? It's not something that we have in the model, but we have three scenarios for uh, the aluminum content in cars uh, by how much is going to increase in the future. 
So maybe if you keep the, the current trend, then we go into this medium scenario for that. If there is a lot of uh, substitution potential with plastics or, or, or steel or, or carbon fibers or whatever, then we would use maybe more the low aluminum content scenario. Uh, so that's more in, in this sense that the model is, is projecting it. Um, at the same time, my understanding of that is that at the moment, aluminum still remains in, in the strongest position in this market. Uh, so there are some uh, uh, materials that can be a competition, but they also come with uh, a lot of problems when it comes to recycling and uh, sustainability and circularity in general. So uh, yes, I, I I don't think it's it's really at the moment, it's, it's still aluminum remains uh, the, the main solution. And um, I'm thinking, I mean, one way to interpret our result is not like w w when I say that the, you know, the demand maybe will uh, increase by a factor of four in 2050, it might not necessarily happen because, you know, it's almost impossible to imagine that it will be so big. And so maybe there will be, you know, alternatives that will be found, but, but still it means that we need to maybe look for these alternatives or make aluminum better or find a way to to reduce this demand one way or, or, or another. I, I don't have the, as I say, it's it's not it's not really a, a prediction, it's not a forecast, so I, I cannot say exactly what will happen, but it's more like pointing at the issue that is here and, and see how we can maybe uh, uh, improve this. Yeah, thank you. And just to add something that I remember from a study with, uh, I was part of uh, last year, the minute you add more materials in, into the mix that, uh, create new challenges in terms of the end of life because when you mix more and more products then you will require more resources to deal with them at the end of life so probably uh, not the best options using um, a lightweighting via substitution of materials only and rather than doing lightweighting by using the actual weight of the of the vehicle mm -hmm. Um, another question we have here is, uh, so the top-down approach analysis uh, analyzes the autom automotive aluminum cycle and highlights the importance of alloy sorting technologies. Could you elaborate on the current advancements or initiatives in alloy sorting technologies? Yeah, well, so again, I'm, I'm not really a specialist on, on this, um, but uh, I know this is something that has been getting much better in uh, recent years. You have this... Uh, uh, Libs uh, sorting, uh, laser-induced uh, breakdown spectroscopy, for instance, or X-ray sorting, that uh, it seems that now it's at a level that is good enough to be used. Uh, it, it seems like it, it works at least at, uh, you know, at a small scale. They are starting to, to deploy it at, at more industrial scale. Uh, I'm not so sure about the challenges that remain, you know, like how clean uh, the scrap must be to be processed by this uh how you know like there is a limitation in in how good uh if, if you have very mixed crap of uh like very a lot of everything and it's a bit dirty then it's not going to be very efficient uh and you have a lot of trade-offs and how selective you want it to be so you know in the end you you, you will have like uh, several buckets where you put the different types of, of scrap if you want very very good uh, specificity of your stores thing that uh, uh, it's almost uh, pure uh, wrought aluminium of this uh, type of alloy uh, then maybe you will not get so much of it because a lot of it has to go with mm, we are not sure if it's really this so we put it in the other buckets um, so these trade-offs I think it's still a bit something that uh, people are, are are researching on that um, and whether it, there is really a case for adopting it uh, is, is a bit early to tell because, you know, for instance, this model is saying like uh, the scrap surplus is really going to be an issue in the future. So if you have a surplus of scrap, maybe the price is getting very low and then having the premium that you need for this very sorting technology makes sense in a business case. But, you know, maybe if these technologies become available, then the price of the scrap never goes so low, or maybe we can find other applications to use it in one way or another. And then it's not very interesting for companies to really invest into this salary sorting. So what I see at the moment is I think some companies really believe in it, some others maybe not really. Uh, so it, it's very hard to, to tell, like, the, I think the technology is there, uh, more or less today, but 
how likely is it to see it implemented really at a large scale? I'm, I'm a bit unsure. Thank you very much. So we reach the end of our time. And so and talking about sorting, the next uh, 45 webinar, it's about aluminum sorting technologies and optimization. So join us for, for that uh, webinar session. Um, for the Q&A, if you want to contact Romain, his email is on screen. Uh, so feel free to uh, reach him in case of further questions. Thank you all for joining us today. And a special thank to Dr. Roman Billy for sharing his valuable insights. We hope this session has provided a clear understanding of the possibilities and challenges and advances toward a low carbon circular economy with the aluminum industry using material flow accounting. And we look forward to seeing you in our next 45 Minutes Home webinar. Have a great day. Bye.